and welcome back to SPF 23 and circularity in the design. If you're just joining us this afternoon, I am tuning in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pakani, and the Sutna and Stony Nakoda Nations and Métis Nation 3 in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Please use the chat function and tell us where you are tuning in from. And if you aren't sure, check out native-land.ca. Today's design visionaries from around the world will converge to unravel the essence of circular design and its pivotal role in the championing of sustainability right from the very inception of creative concepts. I'll be joined in a moment by guest speakers, Blair Barnett, BFDG production designer, chair of British Film Designers Guild, Imogen Ross, eco sonographer and NIDA sustainability manager, NIDA National Institute of Dramatic Art, Marion Weehack, production designer, DGC National Art Caucus rep, DGC National Sustainability and Climate Action Committee, Directors Guild of Canada, and Anu Schwartz, Art Director, Production Designer, IATSE Local Unix, uh, United Scenic Artists 829 Sustainability Committee Chair. Wow, everybody that's joining us today is very well um, decorated and connected. I am excited to hear from them. But first, we are thrilled to welcome Matt Herman, co-founder, Can Do Technologies and Services, Inc., who will share a special presentation about Urban Jacks. Hi, Matt. Hey everyone, I hope you can see my presentation and I'm thrilled to be here too. <clears throat> Let me get straight into it because we're on a tight schedule today. As we, as we all know, there's a, wood is a big part of productions and it's also a big financial burden to get rid of it. And it not only financially impacts companies, also the emissions and, the, or, and also the the environmental impacts are quite significant, as we can see here, with about 24 million tons of CO2 uh, released just on the North American continent. And that's why the founding group of Urban Jacks came together. Me, Matt Herman, a wood scientist. In the middle, Aaron Laszlo, our founder and CEO, who has extensive experience in his, uh, in his business um, career. And Chin Ho, who's like, who had startups experience before and is a collector of degrees in all kinds of fields from sustainability to technology. Urban Jacks is a sustainable lumber solution where we take small waste pieces of productions, furniture makers, deconstructed homes, and then mill them into beautiful new lumber, as you can see behind me. What we do is we take movie offcuts, we take the strike sets, we cut the defects out, broken pieces, Join them together through a process called finger joining, where we apply glue in the milled parts and then form pieces up to 16 or 20 foot of length, saving CO2 emissions. And we're able to save up to 50% of our clients and customers' disposal costs while giving additional life cycles to a beautiful product that we all love to work with. What problems do we solve for the movie industry? We're able to provide a consistent premium quality product that eliminates the step of ripping pieces before to get a straight input material. We're able to provide trackable ESG data to meet your sustainability goals, as well as create diversion reports from all the ways that we got from movie sets, from your sites and <clears throat> support your targets. What's the call to action today is if you're interested in lowering your emissions, your dumping costs, reach out to any one of us, me or my co-founders, and we make sure you get a pin on site where you collect all your lumber cutoffs and we're going to process it through uh, into new dimensional lumber. Here's our website. You can reach us through info at urbanjacks.ca or you can reach me directly at matt at urbanjacks.ca. Looking forward to any one of you reaching out and being interested in lowering your emissions, making the world a greener space and giving wood as many life cycles as possible. Thank you for the time. And I hope everyone enjoys today's panel discussion and has a good time. Thanks, Matt. Terrific. It's so great to learn about this product. 
So um, let's get started. I'm going to throw it over to each of you uh, one at a time, and you can tell me a little bit more about how your work intersects with sustainability and design and um, how you're coming into this conversation here today. So uh, why don't we start with Imogen Ross, who's uh, right to my left here on the uh, Zoom window. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, and I just wanted to say hello to everyone and acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the country, the traditional countries of Gadigal, Darug, Bidjigal and the Darawal peoples who had the traditional lands from the mountains to the sea in what we now call Sydney. And um, I'm really thankful that I am able to come to you from this land where stories have been told around fires and from person to person for centuries upon centuries. Um, I am uh, currently working as the sustainability manager at the National Institute of Dramatic Art. You can see my little thing behind me, um, but I'm also a production designer and eco scenographer and I've been working in live theatre and events for over 30 years here in Australia and sometimes in Europe. Um, eco scenography and sustainable practice um, has been part of what I do for 30 years, though I must say that in the last decade, the urgency of um, transforming my own practice and observing the practice of the theatre companies and the event companies that I work with has started to uh, come to the fore. And I have started um, shifting my own philosophies, my own practice, and the conversations I have with everyone I work with um, towards uh, embedding sustainable thinking and circularity into what we do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Blair. Hi, my name is Blair Barnett. Uh, I'm a production designer originally from Los Angeles, and now I live in London and work uh, mostly in Europe. Um, I'm the chair of the British Film Designers Guild and uh, on a lot of committees. I'm on the art director of the ADG's Green Coalition in America um, and also part of a Hungarian guild that's just been started part of art Seneco uh, for Europe and I do I do a lot of speaking engagements on this on uh, circular design and trying to bring a conversation between our department and production um I've worked in the industry for just about as long as you have about 30 years I've started as a scenic artist and have been vehemently uh, advocating towards sustainability and like reducing waste as much as possible, even from the, the earliest doors. I was the, the great hoarder of everything that I found on the construction floor and kept my own little workshop um, outside of the studios. And people would actually come to me to get big chunks of polystyrene or whatever it is that they needed that was just left over. Um, and that, that's just, I've just been passionate about it since I was a child. I've taken it into my workplace and now I'm trying to lead productions and my entire team to, to be sustainable and as much as I can with everything that they do. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I've got a lot of stuff in my basement too, Blair, so I get it. Marion, go for it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of my colleagues here. Um, as you know, my name is Mary Mihak. I'm in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm a production designer with the Directors Guild of Canada. And I'm on the National Directors Guild Sustainability Committee and the Ontario Green Screens and various other affiliate groups that are trying to push sustainability in our industry. Um, and in terms of my own practice, I mean, without actually realizing that's what I that's what the focus was. I've incorporated kind of the, basically the, the, the basics of circular design for years, partially driven by you know, economy and budget, aesthetics, you know, the texture you get from real things, and uh, practicality. But in the last you know maybe seven or eight years, it's become a very definite and deliberate um, quotient in my design practice. And I'm just trying to really push it forward and normalize it by actually trying to encourage people uh, and, and how easy it can be, in fact, because I really do believe it's not brain surgery, it's something we can all do, and it, it does not limit our creativity in any way. So that's my real push. Okay, and hopefully we can have that discussion through it. 
Exciting. Thank you. And Anu, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Anu Schwartz, production designer and art director in uh, New York City. And I work primarily in motion picture. And I'm also the uh, sustainability chair at United Scenic Artists Local 829. Uh, and I've been uh, an environmentalist probably my whole life. Uh, and when I got into the film business many, many years ago, I realized quickly how at odds it was with sustainability and just environmental stewardship and um, felt uh, I got in early with some early organizations in the in uh, the New York area and felt um, how important it was to try to work toward moving the industry toward a more sustainable effort and started a, co a, a founder, founding member of the Sustainability Committee at USA 829 and uh, really have found a place to create the work that I think is important to get uh, our industry moving in that direction uh, through education, through um, uh, studies and, uh, and um, just being an advocate for sustainability and a place where ideas can thrive. And that's our main goal and co coalition building because it's, uh, it's an important aspect of how we can really make change in our industry. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm pretty excited to have this group together here. And it really amazes me how so many of us, and I include myself in this because I was, you know, I also tried to do this many years ago, and how many people have been working towards this for so long. Um, and yet I feel like there's really been a huge um, sea change in the last, I don't know, is it 18 months or something like that, where many, many people were, you know, working for years and years and maybe even decades to say, hey, we have to change this system. And now uh, many people are waking up to this. And so very excited to have your knowledge to share with our attendees. So I guess we'll just start with a, a, a let's do a baseline kind of question and say, how do you define circularity in design? And why is it important in today's world of design and manufacturing? And I do include that because I think sometimes it's part and parcel to what you do as production designers and within the art department. And so, um, you know, why don't I throw to Marion first, and then I'll go, I'll just say Blair, Imogen, and Anu, let's just go in that order and tell me a little bit about what you think. Um, I think fundamental to circularity, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a term coined from circular economy and, and Al MacArthur, et cetera, but I think for our application, it, it would take the same basic a pathway, meaning, you know, materials become waste and that uh, nature is regenerated. And so we don't, we don't, we just are not wasteful. We, our, our goal has to be zero um, waste. And that, of course, connects to the zero carbon, all that kind of stuff, or, or, or reduced carbon footprint. And I think we just have to do everything we can to sort of approach our design practices in, in film and in, in life to it and extend to other areas of you know, architecture, interior design, et cetera. But to, to very much plan your exit strategy <laughs> at the outset. And I, I, this might uh, leap ahead to a few questions I know that you have for us later, Melanie, but it's just something I think we have to just accept is that we have to plan what is going to happen at the end of our project right at the outset. We can't sort of leave it to be this tacked on solution at the end. So to me, that's extremely fundamental as part of the design process. And it's also a very creative part of it. And, and personally, I don't I find it uh, hampers my creativity at all. And I think that's one of the most encouraging aspects we can, we can help um, share is that circularity in design is very creative. It can be very creative at the same time as it, it, it actually supports um, you know, nature, our environment, and our industry as a whole. So that's just what we might chat about it. Blair or Imogen, did did anybody want to throw anything else in there? I mean, maybe we've defined it and we can move forward, but is there anything else we should be thinking about? I think it's important to understand uh, the problem and measuring the problem. And we've taken steps 
at uh, through our committee to measure what these problems are. And we uh, did a study through Green Spark Group, who created a circularity study, and it was very informative. Um, and we plan to use that as a tool to help our membership, of which we have several trades within our our union. We have costume design, production design, art directors, coordinator, uh, art department coordinators, scenic artists. Um, forgive me if I'm forgetting anyone, <laughs> but. Um, these concepts can be applied through studying what the pro problems are and developing systems in order to solve those problems. Um, and personally, we all can do our part if we know where to to where to solve where to find the issues and then how to solve them. Is we can come up with our own systems. And I, and that's a, a a way that I work within my departments is uh, enabling people to come up with their own systems and implement them. I create a culture. I think it's important uh, as much as practice. I think you hit the nail on the head with that in uh, in creating a culture. And it's not only just in the doing is that we need to influence the people around us and rewrite the narrative of what is the normal. Um, and you know, right now in media, when you're talking about sustainability, you've got two different punchlines. And one of them is um, that it is a joke, like, um, oh, I can't throw this bottle away or it's polar bears won't have a habitat at the zoo. Do you know, that's what our writers are writing. Or it's an angry person who's shouting with their fist in the air, you know, an unhinged eco warrior. Um, but they're all extremes. And um, we have to, for society, rewrite that narrative. I mean, me, I, I talk to the writers all the time and get them to try to put them things in their scripts. But um, even when you're talking to production, we as the art department have a tendency to be very apologetic and uh, asking for permission to do things quite regularly where uh, it's very, very important for us to actually stand up and take up space the same way camera does or the DAP or the director does and 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 speak things in a positive I'm going to do this manner of you know not defiancy but just you know, like it's normal this is what we're doing repeating yourself again and again and again and like you said giving uh the people in your department the opportunity to 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 bring things to the table on their own to come up with their own devices people get excited when you the younger people it's the, the the youth is great they're really excited about this they're really invested in their planet and if you give them that opportunity to to search for things and bring them to the table, they will. I love finding out about new things for my crew. Yes, thank, just, you, thank you. Yeah, hop in, Imogen. Oh, uh, thank you. No, I just wanted to jump back in um, to what Marianne um, was speaking about at the beginning about the cyclical ways of thinking. Um, and uh, because I'm working primarily at the moment in live theater and events, we're using um, the very well-known book, the Theatre Green book um, that Blair would know about. It was written in the UK by theatre architect Paddy Dillon. And we're now going to be shortly going to be using the Australian version that's just recently been launched um, here. And circular thinking is embedded in the Theatre Green book. And what it is doing, which is different to carbon accounting, because I know we're we're now all becoming very aware of Albert and uh, the need to calculate our carbon, but that still has a linearity to it that is different to circularity. Because if you um, rely on the measuring of, of carbon so that you can then offset it um, and it sort of tallies up with um, you know, new budgetary requirements and new grant requirements to account for your carbon. It doesn't change the thinking or the practices that are occurring at the grassroots level, which um, are about knowing where things come from and then knowing where they go at the end and, and incorporating uh, the whole cycle of material life from the beginning to the end of use, not the end the end of use, and then sort of how to bring it back in again. So I think we have these two systems operating at the moment in production. One is the more linear 
focused one, which makes the money, the money counters happy, the, which is the carbon accounting. Um, and, I, and I don't diss that, that is very important. But uh, we also need to embed that circularity of thinking, um, where things come from, where do they go into all of our practices, which involves a lot of waste stream discussions. Mm -hmm. Was there anybody else that wanted to elaborate or, or jump in on this any further? I don't know if, if perhaps this is, might be a good place for me to just do a quick uh, view of that case study I did that because it was basically an embodiment of circular design as applied to a specific film project. And sure. It might be useful for you know um, our, our, the group here, but also anyone who's watching this to just, just as an example. And, and we found that uh, amongst discussion that uh, a case study is a really good way to sort of encourage people, look, you can do this too, or in a slightly different way. So anyway, this is a, a case study and we won't watch 16 pages, you don't have to look at the whole thing, but you can access this. Um, I don't know if you could perhaps put it as in the chat link for people to access the PDF, but um, it's also available through dgcgreen.ca. It's, it's in the art department tab on that. Anyway, this was a, a medium-sized feature film I did in Winnipeg, uh, in Canada, a few years ago, like two years ago. And we, we gathered their department together right at the outset to talk about, like, like let's do this uh, as sustainably as possible, kind of ASAP, but also in a circular way. So if you just uh, slowly start going through the pages, please, Matt, I'll try to explain things. So this is the, the overview with medium budget. That's the storyline. And it just shows how uh, sustainability and effective budget strategies can both win. Okay, so kind of linking to the uh, business case aspect of it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we had goals set up uh, to use modular circular design, design for disassembly, rely on sustainable materials and suppliers, and reduce and eliminate single use products. So those were kind of the main things uh, that our goals were. And then the, the, the basic outcome, you can see, we actually had 60% recovery of materials and assets for reuse. That was through donations or other shows bought them, that kind of thing. Uh, we had a 30% reduction of the typical tipping fees and landfill. We actually made 5,000 bucks in cash sales because of, or uh, plus we bartered for recovered materials because we rented things from some people that they took our, some of the things we built back in exchange for the cost of the rental. And there's basically a savings overall in both manpower and materials. So I think one of the main things we have to do, the bump is, is to convince production managers, producers, that this isn't a money losing game. It's, it's an environmental winning game, and it can also be uh, an effective uh, business goal too. Maybe just quickly, so anyways, we don't have to look at all these. You can look at it on the website, see if there's any other pictures, but that's the nice accolade from the director. Um, it explains also what circular design build really means. You can go on to the next one as well. Um, so again, this is just the highlights of what we what our goals were and what we, uh, what we achieved. So again, 60% recovery materials and assets, reduction and, and savings. So that's those are the main key points. Uh, next one. And then these are just some of the fundamentals. So just I'll just link, if you also look at dgcgreen.ca under the art partner tab, we have a list of top tips and it's everything from think reusable, modular and circular design, to going paperless, to not using uh, glue. That, and we have various tips there that you can look at. And so for this project, I just kind of um, singled out a few that we could try to achieve during, the project, during this project. So we, we designed modularly. So everything was four by 10 flats, all window, everything open was four foot wide even though we were matching a location that had like three foot, seven foot, seven inch windows. So anyways, we just tried to make everything modular so that it could be reused as a system later on. Okay, you can go on to the next one. Um, this is, again, I also bought quite a few um, architectural elements from like finder places, architectural reclaiming type places and built them into the set, uh, largely for aesthetic reasons, but also very much for, um, um, sustainable reasons because again once we were finished with them we just pulled them out and put them up for resale so they were never built they weren't built from new lumber they were built from their existing bookshelves cabinets fireplaces all that kind of thing and then it, they went back into the system after we were finished with them okay and we also um subfloor if you're building a studio um we rented a whole 
whack of subfloor from a, a, a warehouse, and it was really subfloor or stuff that was possibly used for a location on the highways and stuff like that, but it certainly suited our purpose for a subfloor, and that was a huge saving too, and then it just went back into the warehouse at the end. Okay, so that's another example of how you can save things. We reuse backdrops, and <laughs> these are just pictures of things that we rented as both the uh, made and new. And again, personally, I don't find that inhibited my creativity whatsoever. So I just want to really encourage that note. Okay, so we can go on to the next picture. Um, we built a tile bath, and it was like an old, um, it was like an old house with uh, the ceramic tiles. And we we glued them to boards that we then attached to the wall, as opposed to putting them right on the flat. So then we could take the boards off and use them in another bathroom set we had. So again, we just tried to think every step of the way so that things were more easily reclaimable. And then at the end of the show, someone could buy the, the plywood with the tiles on them to use in their own home if they wanted to. So, okay. Um, so you can see there's two bathrooms there and it's the same set of tiles that we used in both, even though they were quite back different bathrooms. Yeah. Oh, light tech. So the sustainable suppliers. Um, this was a material that in fact was 95% was recycled all on its own and it was a perfect ceiling uh, tile uh, panel. So just wherever you are, look for your, your own suppliers that uh, can provide this kind of uh, great thing. And then again, another show bought all these uh, panels off, off of us at the end. So not only was the material itself already 95% recycled, they were put to, to a second use after us. Okay. Yeah, yes. um, those are testimonials. We can pass by that. And yeah, so they just uh, other resources. So that, I think that's enough that gives you an idea of how one project, it was, I have to say, it was actually super easy to do. So I just wanna like encourage you to, to, to believe that that's true. And my construction coordinator was fantastic. He'd been wanting to do something like this for years and my entire art department was really on board with it. So um, there are, there are you know, sure there are challenges, but I think there are a lot of things we can do yeah, that, that, that achieve uh, circular design and sustainable production. Thanks. Thank you for that. I do think that the case studies and the examples are so helpful. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Hanu. Like, people do want to see how it can work. It feels like it's this gigantic concept. And I also appreciate there's a few things that, you know, were brought up in, you know, kind of just even answering this first question about, like, actually, if you... you oh, sorry. I got a little dude here. <laughs> <Sorry>. oh. <laughs> Even when you're in a live stream. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Uh, the little guy is home right now. Um, uh, anyway, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, I really appreciate the fact that we're also talking about how we can um, re-examine how we look at the budget. So even just back to your point, Imogen, about Albert, I want, I mean, I hope that uh, as we use Albert more effectively in our industry, we're not only looking at it um, as a way to capture our data at the end, because of course that is a very linear way of looking at things. But in fact, really we're using it as a tool at the beginning and it's helping us see where can I, where are my opportunities and what happens if I do this and what happens if I do that? And hopefully we are, uh, more and more people are using that tool in that capacity so that we're not just thinking about it from that perspective of I've done my production. And I know actually, of course, when we're setting things up with Albert, you do have to put it in there at the beginning. But we want folks to be using it in this way to help them mitigate and to make different creative choices as well. Um, but also, um, absolutely, if we look at different ways of um, spending our money, whether they're rentals or whether we're bartering or it's, uh, you know, all the different opportunities that are out there, how is that going to impact our budget? And we want to bring that forward. I think it's unfair to say that when you're sustainable, you're always going to be seeing cost savings. I think if we, you know, say that from the hilltops and say, hey, if we're sustainable, we're going to save money all every time. I think probably 
people will say, well, what about this? This costs more. What about that? This costs more. But actually, if we look at it holistically, in fact, when we're sustainable, we're using our resources the most wisely. And in fact, it will ultimately pay dividends and it will become more um, cost effective in the long run. We just have to really find that holistic view. So, uh, you know, all of those things I think are so important. Um, something- If I could that, jump yeah, in. Yeah, Anu, talk about that. So I've been discovering through my my contacts in my with employers that they're I primarily work for uh, the studio in the studio system in the U.S. and I've been learning that there are budget lines for sustainability because we work for large corporations. I work for large corporations that have ESG uh, programs. You know they 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 have initiatives for carbon reduction. And I've been learning that there's little known about this, that there are budgets at the studio level earmarked for sustainability per project. So I would implore people to look into that. Your, your line producer may not even know. And you know, if you work for some of the major studios, there are sustainability executives at these studios. And I just try to be uh, proactive and find out what and what policies they have in place and what earmarked budgets they have in place. It could come down to making a decision. I'll give an example. If you need to create a deck for a set and it costs more to rent on a rental period for steel deck, which would be the more sustainable choice versus building it out of wood, uh, there may be some earmarked money to, to pay for the longer uh, rental. So there, just as an example, there are certain ways to grab that budget line. And as designers, we're often the first in on a project. Uh, and to Blair's point, where we were discussing about influencing, and and you're you're in a we're we're in a unique position to set to set the tone, set the culture, set the budget for sustainability. Uh, and uh, w when I'm an art director, I'm looking to pad my budget for sustainability through tools that I use for cataloging, uh, photographing, uh, keeping good documentation of sets for reuse later. If you're on a TV show, it's a great uh, system to reuse as you move through a season. If you're on a movie and you want to make those sets available for other movies, being organized through good documentation can sometimes take a little bit more labor, but pays dividends both sustainably and maybe financially. You know, studios will sometimes sell assets through their sets. You know, millwork, windows, doors, these are all great candidates. Flats, these are all great candidates for reuse. And if you have good documentation, you, you can be much more successful. And that, that's part of a, a broad uh, approach toward uh, sustainability and circularity in, in the work that I do is I really start from the beginning and I start from every decision. We all make these decisions every day in our, in our work. And th there tends to be very strict uh, pillars around these decision-making, one being budget scheduling, and then there's the creative and there's what we're designing. And I like to say that if I if I layer a fourth pillar within all of the decision-making and sustainability as a decision tree, every decision that comes to me, how is, what does it, no matter how big or small, what does the impact of that decision have on the environment and emissions? And if you start to take the sum total of every decision you make and you layer the sustainability factor on top of it, we're really getting to a place where we can make change. Yeah, that's that's what valuing sustainability is all about, isn't it? And that's it's one of these invisible things that we've somehow we don't have a price tag on and it's just this thing, but actually we need to value it. And the more value it has, the more we will prioritize and prize these different systems. 
So uh, I don't know, Blair or Imogen, did you want to hop in on that? And then I have, you know, I wanted to maybe go next to conversations around building culture and rewriting the narrative and maybe how that can happen within an art department when you are exactly in that position of being a decision maker. So maybe I can throw to the two of you next and then we'll take it from there. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll just jump in um, because I was thinking, Anu, what you were saying about um, documenting everything really well, which is what production designers and art directors do. It's sort of where it can fall down, of course, is in the sustainability lockup phase. Where do these things that you've documented go while they're, you know, in hiatus, while they're waiting for the next creative project? And that's something that we're dealing with here in Australia, which is the lack of places to put things, which seems really strange given the size of our country. But there is a distinct lack of places to store things uh, for the next iteration. And in fact, many of our um, film companies and theatre companies have been selling off their stock to the general public because they don't have places to store them. And I think this is going to become an increasingly important thing for all of us as supply chains um, get crunched and as material availability starts to get crunched, you know, for a variety of reasons globally. But there will be a, a time where actually having storage of things is going to be very vital to continue to, to make what we do and to design what we do. So I think that's a, that's a very pressing issue in my mind at the moment is how do we create sustainable lockups? I think that's a great term, Marion, that I saw in your document. And libraries. And and libraries but to piggyback off of that also a new little problem that we have is um ip and studios not wanting to get rid of things and keeping things forever we'd rather just destroy something or hold on to it forever um, rather than let another their production use it even though it's a staircase or a banister or whatever paint it another color nobody's ever gonna know it's the same thing but people are like no this is ours this is mine we crew for this that never used to be the way and we would have seen books we would have flats we would share things we'd look at each other's uh, you know growing up when i was first working i mean we everybody shared those things flats you just cut another hole in and then there you have you have a new wall you know, but now it just seems like no production is willing to uh, to to share those things or let them go to somebody else. Um, so they just store them. And there's things that are in storage for years and years and years and years and years until suddenly they just decide they don't care anymore. And then they've either gotten so damaged by being in our wet climate for so long and stored badly, or they're like, okay, this all needs to be gone tomorrow. I don't care about selling it. Oh yes, we've been storing it for 10 years, but it needs to be gone tomorrow. And then they just skip it all. So um, yeah, that's another thing to compound the storage problem. Um, I just want to, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, this sustainable lockup thing, I, I tell you, it's like, it's complete bee in my bonnet to imagine, but um, it's interesting that you say that Blair, because I, I found that um, like my, my, construction coordinator colleagues in Toronto here, they actually have this real ad hoc system of communicating with each other. And of course, everything's slowed down right now because of the strike. So we're sort of talking about non-strike times, I think. But they yes. actually have a, 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 a pretty active and successful ad hoc system of phoning each other saying like, you know, hey, I'm finishing a show, do you need some flats? Or someone who needs some flats saying, hey, when do you finish? And I think that's great, but actually what, what you know, here at Richard, we were doing the other day um, with actually Zena Harris from, um, from Greenspark about like what can we do to sort of make sure that the sharing is something a little more systemized. So whether it's like the assets that we have a shared catalog and whether it's local or whether it's like, you know, it doesn't really make sense for us to share stuff with uh, people in California or, or Australia because that's just, the shipping is ridiculous, but certainly local sharing uh, apps or and uh, and a lockup as you say Imogen, because i don't know if you if you have a system like the community broadcasting corporation in canada but when i first started the industry that's exactly the model they had it was like a warehouse full of flat 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 stores 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 windows 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 and again it was a different system because it was part of the broadcasting corporation but i still feel that model can really work and be and be useful and for that kind of purgatory time between and things aren't getting used. So anyways, I think it's something we should all really try to push for. 
put this again. I think we're certainly trying that in through. New York. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Anu. Oh, I was just going to say we're we're certainly focusing on that in New York and trying to utilize, you know, uh, advocacy through local government to, to maybe in, assist in in helping the industry create uh, affordable storage. As you know, New York has uh, uh, very little space to do something like this. But yes, it's a really important uh, key factor in working circularly. You know, one a positive thing is, is I don't know if you, you guys have found this where you're living, but at least once a month, I see an article in, in the major papers saying how because of the hybrid form of working and people not going back to the offices, there's office towers that are just like empty, like they don't have offices. And I kind of think, surely, surely there must be so, you know, several thousand square feet that could be used towards this kind of thing we're talking about. And you know, given, given the fact that you know, the, work, the, the work from home has become a more commonplace situation. And that personally in Toronto, that's what I'm, I'm talking to people about. It, it, it has to exist. So I don't know if that's the case where you guys are too because of the, the work paradigm shift. There's definitely potential there. And the new, the recent Ontario Green Screen Waste Report did highlight that this was one of their areas of it's a big gap, basically, storage for the sustainable lockup. And that really we need to figure out how to identify real estate and real estate has a real money side to it. And so I think the monetization of this is that conundrum that people are trying to solve, right? So um, I think many bright minds will be able to come together, but we certainly see the need, I think, across many different jurisdictions of how this can be one of those problem solvers, but just figuring out, you know, how are you going to document it? Who's going to run it? How are you going to make sure that things don't get destroyed? It has to be useful. Like there's a lot of pieces to it, but uh, I do see it as something that's important. Um, and I, I'm hearing it a lot. So I'm hoping that more... Um, comes to fruition there. Um, I just wanted to jump in, Melanie, and say I know that there's some um, there's a lot of energy being put into exactly that in different parts of Europe at the moment. I believe there's a coalition of German production designers, and there's also some Scandinavian designers okay. who have set up online um, uh, online libraries. I think Shift It is one um, in Scandinavia that is being trialed at the moment, which is using Anu's method of documenting and photographing and uploading uh, so that other designers and production companies can log in, see what's there. And it it's more like a digital storage of multiple objects, but the objects themselves are stored in their own locations. And then part of the, the budget decisions is about working out how to get them from one place to another. Um, just just while before we move on, I just wanted to answer Blair's well, not answer, but but um, respond to Blair's comment about um, intellectual property and IP, and that's something that again we've been looking at in Australia, and I wonder if it would be worth putting into designers' contracts and art department contracts that uh, you tick a box to say you don't mind if your designs are reused in another form, and it becomes an opt in and that would very quickly sort out um, those who say oh no my design must never be used by anyone else again unless I get royalties and those who go yeah, yeah what about paint it pink <laughs> that's yeah that's great um, I'm, I have a clause in my deal memo that's very similar to that and that it does say that I will try to do things in a sustainable way I have that from from day one um, but um, a lot of times it's, it's the bigger studios on larger jobs and they want to hang on to anything that could be associated to their, you know, USP, do you know, they just like, it has to stay. Nobody else can use it. I, I never experienced that in the past. It just seems to be kind of a new trend. I think just on that note, I mean, um, you know, all designers, I, I've, I mean, if I was to use a set, if I, you know, if, producer or if I found a set that existed, I'd probably want to adjust it anyway for my own, like for the own intentions of the story I'm doing. Yeah. So like, you know what I mean? Like I, I, just, I don't think it, it would ever just take a set as is. And sometimes in the, if it's in a studio and it's there and the, and the producer said, let's use that. Even so, I think there'd be adjustments made. So, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's a good thing to sort of maybe have some kind of uh, quotient in, in, the, in the deal memo. 
to qualify where you stand on that as the as the designer, but at the same time, it's um, you know, it isn't our intellectual property anyway. It's it's like we sign it away, right? It's, it's the, mm -hmm. the companies. But I would, my my hunch is most of us would change things a bit anyway, so they change. So, so it doesn't make very sense. But it's just an anecdotal comment. I know that there is a company in LA, a EcoSet. Um, They're and great. They and they're fab. I'm sure you know them if you've done any work in LA. Um, and you know what what they've said about this because I've certainly experienced this before around the IP piece. And they said that in terms of you know a lot of what they do is they work really directly uh, with the production companies very concertedly to identify the key and hero props or pieces that are could be spoilerish or you know whatever it might be, um, and then. And those are the identified pieces that have to, you know, can't be released and that there's other things. So again, there's some labor, there's some time there, uh, but it feels like that there could be dialogue around that, that could be, uh, you know, part of the solution. But certainly I, I've seen that. Um, oh, I'm, I'm just getting a little bit of a time check there, but certainly uh, it's, it's one of the conundrums that we need to solve if we're going to try to be reusing pieces. Um, we also I have Kama were... Assets for the UK that does a similar thing as well. Just wanted to throw that name out there. They're great. Perfect. Kama Assets. Kama Assets? Kama uh, Asset Store. They do a similar thing, cataloging. Everything stays in their own location, but they gather all the assets and make it available, an available library for people to go through. And there is a U.S. app that's called Reaply that does something similar. Um, they're dominantly working in the building space. Uh, but I believe they're interested in developing into the film and television side. Um, you know what? It's like tickety-boo here with us. Um, there's so much to talk about, and we're getting close to our time. So we have a few questions from the audience. So I know we didn't get through everything we've wanted to talk about, but also I'd love to be able to uh, connect with folks who are asking us some questions. So here's one from the audience. Do you have any experience with vector sets? Um, that offer paper-based sustainable sets and how do newer materials such as paper sets fit into the circular process? Not sure how they compare with traditional materials in terms of reuse. So maybe somebody wants to take that one. I've, I've worked with vector sets a, a lot, actually. And there were pros and cons. I mean, it's a fantastic product. It's super lightweight. It's easy to move around. You had a, less stress on the people who are moving things so you could treat our artists as sustainable as well. Do you know, we weren't abusing the people moving the sets around. It costs a lot less to transport them. We were able to use uh, electric vehicles in and out of London to be able to move all of our sets, which were made out of paper. Um, it, there were some problems with uh, surfacing. The, the, a lot of them have printable surfaces, like shiny kind of front that you could print directly onto them to get a two-dimensional uh, texture. But we we textured things as well with pulp, uh, with pulp art surfaces. We made some three-dimensional textures on top of them, which came off. Um, so uh, that was really nice. Um, and we actually surprisingly were able to wrap out on the day um, really quickly because it didn't take, we were only supposed to be making things safe and just moving things around so they could come in and clean. And uh, we were on such a roll. We were, we struck the entire set and put it on the back of trucks. And so the production was able to off hire the location a day early and we didn't need it the next day because they were so easy to move in and out. So across the board, it really helped reduce costs and uh, impact. I'm just curious, uh, just a question for me. Are they a one use kind of set? I've never actually used them before. You can use them again and again and again and again. You can drill into them. You could put boards up. You could hang shelves on them. You can do everything. Um, you have to kind of repair things. I mean, if you cut things, obviously it's kind of hard to join them back up, but they're modular. It's sets that are modular. Um, and they, they, they're they quite sturdy and quite stable. So until they just kind of fall apart, uh, yeah. you can continue using them. I'll look it up. I mean, there's a company that place, that company that made those panels I showed in that case study. They're making something similar for trade shows and things like that. And they've devised actually a, a connector thing too, but it hasn't yet made it onto a, a set, a, a, an industry set as far as I know, but I'll, I'll definitely look up vector sets, thanks. 
Um, we're pretty close to our time here. We have about five minutes left. I wondered if we could uh, go around the room here and talk a little bit about how do you build this culture within your art department? How do you come into a design uh, or into a project or a job and have a conversation with your director, uh, with the director of photography, with your team um, and other heads of department? Maybe it may affect um, construction. How do you get people online with your way of thinking or approaching things? What are maybe some of the challenges you faced and how maybe have you solved or just approached some of these situations? Whoever me, wants it's to mostly, for me, it's mostly just communication, trying to find out the needs of what that is, <clears throat> not being so siloed in your thinking and, you know, finding out, like, getting the DP to say, exactly what he's shooting and what we actually need making conversations you know do you really need this night shoot you know does it, it's written you know you walk out to a night does it really need to be at the night do we need to light all of this can this can the narrative still work in the day asking these questions to to make changes because sometimes people just make a random decision not knowing the impact that it's going to unpack um, it's just communicating as much as you possibly can with people that you might not necessarily have that comfort level talking to. Just get in there. Yeah, I agree. That's really my approach. You know, it's it's intentions. I let make my intentions known with collaborators and with the crew. It's it's the practice and it's organization. It's all of these things that. I try to instill throughout my department. And I always find with collaborators, if you make it known, they're really willing to come on board with this idea of working more sustainably. And like Blair said, there's many ways to do something. And if you just have the ideas, people will come around to it. Um, okay, well, we have three minutes left, so... I, I, I agree. I just want to endorse you. I agree with both what uh, Anu and Aguero have said, and that communication is key, and I think you can develop your own strategies, how it will work within the, within the area that your purview you know, covers, but it, it, uh, it, it shouldn't have to be a deterrent to get your other collaborators to, whether it's your DOP or anything. And, and I know that the line producer, the typical line would be as long as it doesn't cost me more money. And I think if you can sort of like <laughs> try to toe that line, then uh, <laughs> that, that's a win there. So yeah, communication. I've been, I've been finding it really interesting to just go down to the shop or go down to the stage and start talking to the crew and just saying like, oh, you use this and why do you use this? And could we do something more sustainable here? And I find this conversation start to spark ideas and you get to understand, you know, how you can find the solutions by just talking and listening. I could just jump in at the very last moment of our talk and, and also say that this the communication is also about leadership. And I think we shouldn't shy away from seeing our role as the co-collaborators with the directors and the writers as that of leadership. And we should be asking our production companies to acknowledge that and to show leadership as well each head of department show leadership and sort of bring everyone on board but somebody needs to start that and I think designers and art directors um, and directors are in a really good position to demonstrate well, that. Uh, yeah. 100%. That's very well said. I think we're all agreed. Okay, in our last minute here, um, may I just go around the room? I'll go Marion, Anu, and then Imogen and Blair. Any final thoughts or like say the first thing that a production designer needs to do next to make their design more sustainable? Um, and then I'm just gonna say to everybody in the audience, please reach out to these panelists on our on our virtual platform and send them your questions because there's stuff we didn't get to. So, but we'll just go around the room one last time and I'm just gonna tell everybody, thank you so much for being here. So Marion, you go first. I'd say plan ahead. Plan, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, plan ahead, plan your exit strategy, strategy right at the start. And it doesn't mean like what, what dumpster you're gonna put your stuff into. It means like where the stuff is gonna to go to next.
yeah, retrofit a design towards the end of life or something and not be afraid of things and, uh, uh, and just be open-minded about a different project or product, a different way of doing things, you know, challenge, take a gamble. Yeah. Thinking of the end cycle before you start for every set that you create. And I would say, see it as an iterative process. You might not get it right the, this time, but each time you and your team move forward, you're going to get it a little bit better. We're all in this together and we don't have a linear solution. There are no linear solutions. We can only keep going around and around and we're going to slowly move forward um, as we get more and more informed and as materials change and waste streams expand. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know we're at our time. So I just want to say I love that idea. Everything in needs an exit plan, right? Um, so beautiful. There's always listen, so much more we can talk Listen to the kids. About. Listen to the kids too. Listen to the young people. They've got so many great ideas. Put your Absolutely. mind Absolutely. 100%. 100%. Um, so yes, that's all we have time for today. So I just want to thank Mary and Anu, Imogen and Blair for their time, for sharing their insights. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so much more that we can learn. And I'm looking forward to having our next conversation today, uh, soon, not today, <laughs> our next conversation soon. Um, and just to say that next up, starting at 5.15 Pacific time, uh, which is just around the corner, we'll be having a spotlight on Australia and New Zealand. So please join us for that. And so that's right. <laughs> So thank you so much for being here with us today. Really appreciate this wonderful brain trust and everything that you've shared with our wonderful attendees um, and have a wonderful evening.